and today we are talking about Divine Rivals by Rebecca Ross. This has a bookmark in it. This was sent to me by Desiree, by my, but my, my friend over at Libri Labra, and this is a book that came out this year. The sequel will be out in December and it has picked up a lot of traction. A whole shit ton of people have read this book and loved it and I said that's a pretty cover but I don't have very good <laughs> I don't have a very good track record with loving books that other people love, which can honestly be kind of annoying because sometimes I get major FOMO. So I cracked this sucker open, literally. I read this somewhat physically and somewhat on audio, and now I'm here to tell you about it. What I'm not going to do is hold it up the whole time, so she's going to sit there. Good question is, am I connected to the neighbor's Wi-Fi or my Wi-Fi? Because that always seems to be a problem here on this channel, along with the problem of me not liking popular books again it's really annoying. So Divine Rivals is a book that has taken the book community a little bit by storm though not in to the same degree as like Fourth Wing by Rebecca Yaros. I am honestly so confused about the love that this book has gotten. I'm shocked by the amount of people that like it. It currently holds a 4.3 on Goodreads. Rebecca Ross is not a new author to me or to the book community. She has a bunch of other books. I've heard a lot of people talk about A River Enchanted by her and I still want to read it. I read her other book, Sisters of Sword and Song, back in, I want to say 2019 or 2020, and I thought that one was fine. I think I gave it like a three. So it added another level of surprise when I hear that this book is suddenly everywhere and most people love it. So color me even more surprised that I am one of those people. This is a contender for favorite book of the year and possibly on my list for favorites of all time. That will really depend on how the sequel goes, which which comes out in I believe December. That's right, you're all shocked. For once I am in agreement with the hype on Book Talk. The hype, I believe, in my opinion, is warranted. No one is more shocked about this than me. Uh, it brings me joy to tell you that I gave this five stars. Does that mean that this book is without its issues? No, absolutely not. No book is perfect, but this was perfect for me. This hit so many notes for me that were just sweet and I didn't want it to be over and I'm gonna try to get in depth. I know we all talked about me getting more in depth about my five star review so let's do that today. I wasn't commissioned to do this. My friend as I said Desiree over at Libri Labra did buy me this book but I cracked this shit open of my own accord because the synopsis really intrigued me and I was very excited to open it but I was thinking mm, I typically don't agree with the hype so it's probably gonna be a bummer. Probably gonna be a three star. Fourth wing is gonna be a three star. I was wrong on both accounts. Maybe I should just stop predicting things because I'm always wrong. As many of you know, I'm trying to learn how to make in-depth positive reviews. I have like a whole notebook. It's over there. I used to take notes recently about how to make positive reviews. The way that I have been learning is by watching writing classes, particularly through Skillshare. I talked about using Daniel Jose Older's course on writing standout opening scenes in the video I did about the gloom between stars. It was helpful for me in talking about the issues I had with the gloom between stars and I'm happy to say that I found out that Daniel Jose Older has another Skillshare class and I like this one even better because it was extremely helpful in me learning how to write positive reviews. Skillshare is the largest online learning community for creatives and they have a wide depth and breadth of topics everything from like illustration for graphic design, photography, music, marketing, and productivity but also writers. There is tons of writing advice on Skillshare. There's so many classes and I recommend these not just to writers but also to people learning how to review which even though I've been doing this for several years and it's my literal job I'm still learning. They have authors teaching writing classes such as Saba Tahir and Daniel Jose Older both of whom I've read from. Saba Tahir is one of my favorite authors. Daniel Jose Older has a class that I really feel helped me write this review in a way that I am actually proud of and I feel like is a quality review. Particularly this class on Storytelling 101, he talks about the four C's of writing. This was really helpful for me in that I looked at his advice and I flipped it and I asked, did the story do what Daniel Jose Older recommended to do? And not just those four C's of character, craft, conflict, and context, but did it marry them 
together in a way that created an excellent book that was also very enjoyable to me. If you don't know, Skillshare is an on-demand platform. It has stackable lessons so members can learn at their own pace, no matter your skill level. So whether you want to learn the basics of watercolor painting or how to start your own creative business, Skillshare has classes to take you from beginner to pro alongside a supportive community who you can chit chat with. And for all of those of us in the author and reviewing community who are basically like completely community oriented and then some of us are also running businesses that that are intertwined with this, they have classes on like freelancing and marketing and entrepreneurship and social media. First thousand people to use my link in the description will get a one month free trial of Skillshare. So if you're looking to hone your craft, whatever that is, <laughs> if you're like me trying to learn how to write for reviews positively, click the link below to get your one month free trial of Skillshare. And thank you to Skillshare for sponsoring today's video. Divine Rivals is a book. <laughs> I loved it. It's about two characters with dual POV. Our characters are Iris and Roman C. Kit. This is set in a world that seems to be modeled after like 1915 England during World War One, which is already very different from your typical fantasy book. This is sort of like historical fiction, but fantasy. But yes, this is a fantasy book because we're not warring between like countries like, you know, actual World War One historical fiction. We are warring between gods. So if I had to describe this book, I would say it's you've got mail, but make it fantasy set in a newspaper a la Lois and Clark and there's warring gods. Our main character, Iris, well, one of our two main character, Iris, her brother, Forrest, at the start of our story goes off to fight for the goddess Enva. Enva is the goddess of song. She is one of the goddess gods of the upper world. Enva being the goddess of song, all I could hear immediately in my head was, And she's battling against a, do a, go a dog, <laughs> a god named Daker, Daker. So the gods call up humans to fight for them. So off Forrest goes to battle at the beginning of the story and he makes his sister Iris promise to be good, go to school, take care of their mom, and that he will write to her, except he never does. And months later, she's no longer in school and she's working at a newspaper where she's in a rival against this guy named Roman C. Kit and they are in a rivalry over this newspaper columnist position. They both work for the newspaper already writing some articles but they both want the columnist position and right now Iris is mostly writing obituaries. Roman C. Kit is a rich guy who she verbally spars with constantly and the banter is so fun. At night she goes home to the apartment where she shares a home with her mother who has become an alcoholic in the months since her brother left for the war. And Iris pours all of her feelings into these written letters that she writes on this typewriter her grandmother gave her. And then she sticks them in, into the wardrobe that she and her brother used to share. And then they magically disappear, literally. And then one day she gets a letter back and it says, this isn't Forrest. This book is so wholly for me. <laughs> I'm gonna try very hard to convince you to try it out and explain to you why it was so incredibly for me in an in-depth review and I'm going to center this on the class that I mentioned, Daniel Jose Older's class on the four C's of Storytelling 101, Character, Conflict, Context, and Craft. I'll keep this part of the story non-spoilery and then at the end I will like just blurt out my spoilery thoughts which are you know not <laughs> well written just me word vomiting. I love this! E. All right so four C's. First C, character. Let's start about talking about Iris and Roman. Iris comes from a lower class family, Rowan from an Rowan? Roman from an <laughs> upper class family. His family is merchants. They own part of the railroads. Despite this, they are quite alike. Older says that you do not have to make your characters likable to create a good story. You just make, need to make your audience care about them and give them some humanity. So we start with Iris viewing Roman Kit through her eyes and how she sees and perceives him and how their dynamic is according to Iris, which initially he seems like a huge dick. But then we get Roman's POV and even though initially we're rooting for Iris, once we switch to his POV it becomes clear that Roman is better than more than we initially perceived him to be. So we start to root for him as well despite them being newspaper rivals. Older recommends having a few things about a character that you love and write these in a way that matter through the eyes of the other character that we are in the in the vision of. So we get to like Roman Roman, not just seeing his POV, but the way that Iris sees him. It's very smart doing dual POV because you really get the most out of your characters that way. I love both Roman and Iris and I loved seeing Iris through Roman Kit's eyes. He's 
because it's so precious that he doesn't realize how that she doesn't realize how much he admires her and I admired her too. Meanwhile in her mind she's always trying to guess what his middle name is so she's like Roman C. Kit that it stands for Roman Conceited Kit, Roman Contrarian Kit. It's just it's cute. And by the end, we see Roman change in Iris's POV from who she thought he was to who he really is. And I love being on that journey with her, getting to go through that phase, all of these phases of like her coming to realize how much he actually adores her was so special. <laughs> Iris's motivation, and motivation is very important in character, Iris's motivation is to get to her brother because she feels like he is all she has left in the world. Her brother is home to her. Rowan's motivation starts out that he wants to win this position at the newspaper, but as you see him learn uh, more about Iris and more about the world around him and go through certain experiences with his family who doesn't really appreciate him or love him in the way that he should be loved and appreciated, his motivations change because he's trying to decide, where do I want my life to go? What's important to me? My family doesn't really care about me. How can I be different than my family? What am I willing to risk? So it's sort of him having his own like coming of age story ignited by him meeting Iris. She really changes the trajectory of his life in such a beautiful way. And in a way like him as well for her. But I think that there's like such an important piece there where it's like he really would have gone down such a route that would have made him so miserable if not for Iris. And she really made him into his best self. Older suggests that writers make their character motivations known to the reader very quickly and also make the reader care very quickly, which is very hard to do. And I think that while the story changes from that initial dynamic with like, them being rivals, that setting to the setting changes to them being colleagues in a war setting, like in the actual war zone, Iris's motivations stay the same, but kits change. And they change in a way that I really enjoyed watching. And the way that their motivations work against each other and then with each other, it was just enough angst to like have a lot of like, you know, clutching your chest moments, but not enough that like rips your heart out. Older says that the fundamental building block of story is conflict. I'm a plot girly, so I agree. <laughs> internally, conflicts are like, where, what is our character going through internally and what things do they need to overcome to get them where they need to be by the end? Our internal conflict for Iris, a lot of it is her loneliness and her desire to make something of herself, which she feels like she's lost the ability to since her brother left and her mom sort of emotionally just abandoned her. I really relate to her feeling of loneliness and I appreciated how it was written and I also love that Roman sort of recognized this and tried in, in the only ways that he knew how to fill that void for her despite him not really being taught that by his own family. For Roman, him abandoning his family's expectations of him and his own expectations of himself, that was his internal conflict. He did something as a teenager that caused his family a lot of grief and heartache, and I think that he tried and tried and tried to meet their expectations in order to feel like he could win back their love and affection. And then his interactions with Iris made him realize that he is worthy of more and wants more than just a life living up to his family's expectations as penance for his mistake. We marry these internal conflicts together with the external conflicts of the ongoing war between Enva and Dacker, humans getting involved in that, Iris wondering if the newspaper is involved in like propagandizing the war, and I think that this really makes for such a rich story, this interweaving of the internal and external conflicts about finding love in a time of war and finding yourself while being in a literal war zone and and family obligation and obligation to gods and it's really unlike anything I've ever, ever read before. The third C is context. So what are the rules of the world and who has the power? There is some light magic in this with respect to the gods existing obviously and we find out a little bit about the gods and honestly I really loved how the author gave us the information that she gave us. I don't feel like she gave us enough but what we did get I loved how we got it because we get these letters through the wardrobe in the beginning. Iris is being told these myths about the gods and in her learning through the letters we the audience are learning along with her which was really like a fun way to learn about the lore in this world and get a better understanding of the gods and the dynamics of the gods and on top of that we are learning this through a magical typewriter thing which was such a fun way to tie in like magic stacked on magic and explaining how these letters find each other was just so cool it, it's something that I've never read in a book before 
before and I just loved it. A really unique use of, of magic that I, I will be thinking about for a long time and probably making like <laughs> when I say like I didn't like how this book used magic it should have been like divine rivals. I'm not really sure how the religion fully works in this world. I'm not really sure how the dynamic is like day to day for humans in relation to these gods if there is any. I don't fully understand how much power the gods have. It seems like the gods are just very powerful beings that live sort of outside of the day-to-day -day human life. When I think warring gods though I don't think like 1915 newspaper rivalry in England setting. So in that way it is still one of the most unique stories I've ever read and that uniqueness really sort of like made me not not need to focus in so much on on not really understanding the religion aspect. So very smart Rebecca, very smart. Sort of like dangling a carrot like you don't need to know all that information look at this unique setting I have we know that the gods call the humans to service and there's like underworld gods and upper world gods Enva is an above god and Dick Dacker Daker is a lower god there's typically like a dark god versus light god dynamic in a fantasy world but in this book it is a god of music versus a god of healing Daker is the god of healing and Enva is the god of music which I thought was such a breath of fresh air <laughs> So once again, Rebecca Ross is like dangling a fun, unique, fresh thing in front of me to keep my attention off the fact that normally, and I still do feel this to a certain degree about this book, I would like to see a deeper examination of how the gods affect the world that we are seeing on like the day to day. But I do still appreciate that history that we got of Daker and Enva. I thought that that story of how, you know, they came to like come together and then separate was so fun. Not for them, but certainly for me. <laughs> I also thought like how that led to the circumstances of our characters. I thought that that was all great. I should also mention that like again to a degree like the characters are also still in the dark about the gods quite a bit in the history and Roman would give Iris bits of myths that he had learned so that we could learn them as well. So could have been better but it's it's still really good and fun and very unique so that's really what I kept focusing on. I could see that being a problem for other readers though. It didn't affect me because again I was so focused on the feeling of reading this and the fun that I was experiencing. <laughs> as far as again to go into that the context of what the audience is experiencing and this will a little bit bleed into the fourth C which is craft by the way. I think Rebecca did a really good job of writing in a very immersive way in my opinion. I could smell the cigarette smoke, I could feel the bombs dropping, I could hear the typewriters because she really wrote in a way that that engaged all of your senses and gave you the full experiences and it was so rich. Older says that the fourth C of craft holds all the other pieces together so craft is really what holds the context characters and conflict all together and I would say that to me Rebe Rebecca's writing is excellent. I really was captivated not just by her engaging all of the senses but the way that she evoked emotion, the way that she used subtle body language of characters, the way she did write lore where she did write it. The sense of dread at the end that she really cultivated so well. <laughs> you know something bad is coming and 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 she just also sprink she sprinkles in like this sense of foreboding while you're still experiencing these like really tender moments and those tender moments are so precious. I think that this is truly like an exemplary work <laughs> when it comes to prose and obviously that's going to be different from reader to reader but this is the kind of writing that stays with me. I didn't feel a real connection to her story in Sisters of Sword and song. But what I do remember is her ability to convey emotion and obviously like the sentences themselves were well constructed and that came through so much stronger here in Divine Rivals in a way that really married together beautifully with her characters and her conflict and her setting and to me that is the sign of a good craft. I want to wrap up this non-spoiler this like non-spoiler section so I'll leave it here by saying this is a five-star read for me. I recommend it. It's on Kindle Unlimited but I highly recommend the audiobook because I think the narrators did a really good job. I consumed this this book like a starving woman in front of a feast. I could not get enough. I was dreading the end. It didn't hit as hard as I was expecting at the end but I am so excited for the next book. I will quite literally beg the publisher on my knees for an arc of this. I really hope you will read it. Please let me know if you already have. If you hated it that's fine too. You're welcome to tell me down below. It doesn't hurt my feelings at all. <laughs> Again I'm just glad you read and I'm happy to talk about books that I loved and you hated or vice versa. 
at any time. I loved this book. I highly recommend it. I hope you all will love it as much as me, but if not, that's okay too. Getting into spoilers, so this is your last chance to exit. I fucking love this book. <laughs> I could weep. I did a little bit. I mean, a lot. I felt very seen by Iris's relationship to her mother who became an alcoholic. My alcoholic parent isn't dead. He's just dead to me. He's not even an alcoholic anymore. <laughs> Part of that is because the last time, not to like, you know, again, dump all my trauma on Maine, but the last time I talked to him, like he denied all of that happened. All the really traumatic shit that happened when he was an alcoholic that of course you don't remember, sir. <laughs> like I was the sober one. It's really traumatic being the only child in a house with an alcoholic parent. So I felt so seen and I wanted to hug Iris. When her mom died, I was so heartbroken for her because that's really where the lonely for her that theme of loneliness really came through and you see that she really has no one and Roman was the only one who figured out that her mom died <laughs> no and like advocates for her stop it bitch I love him the typewriters being family heirlooms oh my god because their grandmas were friends didn't see it coming loved it if you don't know I do genealogy so family heirlooms are very special to me so when it's a magical family heirloom I'm a sucker for that shit my grandma's sister died when she was 15 and the only remnants of her ever existing, obviously she never had kids, the only remnants of her existing I own and I uh, take very good care of them and I feel like very honored to have them because it's the only thing left of Dorothy. I have her diary. She, actually, there's this page where she had broken a bone at one point and she was like, all I'm doing is sitting at home and reading all the time. And I was like, Dorothy, I wish I could go back in time and give you a hug. Anyway, family heirlooms kind of, kind of a big deal for me. I'm a sucker. I love the backstory of Dacre and Enva. If that is indeed the real myth and Roman had it right, they are a very like Hades and Persephone type thing, except in this version, Hades, Dacre is very selfish despite him being the god of healing. But I feel like we don't know enough about Enva. I kind of feel like she's a little bit sinister too. But I loved him being the god of healing because those fighting for him are like, well, he's benevolent. I mean, he like healed me. Of course we follow him. And instead of like being this god of death, he's the god of healing. So obviously, for soldiers in the middle of a fucking brutal war, being healed is a big deal. Roman C. Kit abandoning his job and showing up at the middle of a war zone. I cannot. <laughs> to be a war reporter with Iris and there are monsters flying overhead and she runs out to the field to get him and they're laying on the field and she still think he hates her and he's madly in love with her. This is the most romantic thing that I have ever read in my entire life. <sighs> okay, bitch, get it together. And the best part is she doesn't know at that point, she still doesn't know that it's him writing her the letters. He doesn't want to tell her yet. And he's like, oh, she's like, oh my God, Roman cocky kit showing up at my new job, trying to be my rival again. And I'm like, oh my God. But he shows up because he's in love with her and he can't bear to be apart from her anymore. I was just clutching my chest because feelings. The ending, all right, the ending, I won't lie to you. I thought it was going to be worse. I, I stopped the book so many times thinking like, oh God, I can't continue. It's going to be so bad and it's going to tear me apart. It didn't. I thought that emotionally I would be devastated. I think that the ending could have been executed a bit better. It's fine. I didn't lower my rating because of it. Like everything's fine except Roman is very hurt and he, um, some person, uh, posing as Roman in like a uh, complete like gas mask outfit is pulling Iris trying to get her out of the war zone and then she sees the real Roman and she's like, who the fuck is this? If my, if my they got married by the way, if my fucking husband he's crawling across the fucking field then like who the fuck is this and obviously it's her brother right like who the fuck else would it be Dacre himself no so obviously it's her brother which you know like <laughs> not not a huge reveal so you know whatever but the problem was not that I saw that part coming the problem was that I feel like she didn't fight him very hard your husband's crawling on the ground he's very hurt ma'am and she was just she was like no don't take me and then he did and I, I don't know like if that were my husband if that were Carl was crawling across the earth and my brother who I hadn't seen in a long time was like no I'm taking you with me you would have to knock my ass out <laughs> you would have to physically bite me to not go get my husband that is my man I just I, I it could have been it could have it could have been like you know he knocks her over the head and hauls her away and then she wakes up in 
her house and like he lies to her and says oh your husband died you know but instead it's like she gets to their house and she's like well it doesn't feel like home anymore home is where Roman kid is and I'm like yeah and you left him there you didn't fight very hard did you so that was a little weird but like whatever you know the rest of the book was so good I ignored it so in the end Roman's about to die and who should show up to heal him the god of healing Dacre and I was like ah oh, that's good shit so they are separated in the end they are married but they are not legally separated but you know physically separated so I'm very interested to see how this plays out <laughs> because oh man I do love a good duology but if that second book does not hit the same like why do y'all think that I haven't read the sequel to Ray Bear it's because I'm so worried that nothing's gonna hit the same as that first book and I heard that it doesn't so I'm like very concerned so I'm a little concerned about how the sequel will go but this book, I have, feel like I'm never, and this is illogical, I feel like I'm never going to read something that makes me feel like this again, that makes me feel things, that has me clutching my chest. It was so cute and so romantic and so magical and I felt like I was there. I can see it in my head. Every time you finish a book like that, you're like, I'm never gonna, f I'll, I'll never love again. But you will. But yeah, it, it oh. Ah! Anyways, that was my review. <laughs> I hope you like my positive reviews as much as you like me ranting because oh my god feelings. <sighs> I feel just as strongly about how much as I, I love this book as I feel strongly about me hating the pawn and the puppet which is saying something. <laughs> Anyways feelings. That's my review. Thanks for watching. Leave your comments and questions down below. Again no hard feelings if you didn't like this book. I'm totally fine. I love it enough for both of us. I love it enough for everybody. All right comments and questions. Like and subscribe if you want to and I'll see you next time. Bye. Hi it's me Trash Can Rachel and and before I go, I have to say thank you for being a friend to my Therapy Bills patrons. And those are Alexander, Ali Magpie, Amanda, Bubble Tea, Cammie, Chris, Claire, Des Robert, DJ Roctopus, Emperor's New Blues. You all have the most hilarious name. <laughs> oh my god. Aaron, Eric, Faror, Harley, Jack and Jill, Johnny, Calais, No K, Casey, Kate, Caitlin, Quinn, Lady Kittybug, Lex, Alice, Peggy Lou, Rain, Reese, Samar, Scarlet, Shiny, and SMK. Thank you all so much for being a friend. And before I go, I have to say thank you for being a friend to my Potato Starch Marxist patrons. And those are AM Angel, Alicia, Amanda, Andy, Angelica, Anita, Artie the Ninth, Ashley, Ava, BB, Beck, Blythe, Bookish Brain Rot, Brie, Brian, Caitlin, Carlin, Catherine, Kathy, Chris, CJ, Cole, Colleen, Corwin, Corey, Darren, Deborah, Diet Goth, Dorian, Dorotea, Ebby, Ember, Emily A, Emily L, Emma, Aaron, Hannah C, Hannah T, Harpy Kuro, Haley, Hello There Darling, Ilya. Yanaka, India Inks, JM Tenet, J is on Olympus, JT, Jen H, Jen Michelle, Jenny G, Jillian, Just Pugsley, Kaylee, Kat, Katie, Katya, Kayala, Kendra, Kylie, Laughing Cat Dog, Laura, Lauren B, Library of Scars, Lisa, LP Altvader, Lou Siri, Luna Moth, Lustful Octopus, Martin, Marcella, Marquita, Maz, Malara, MK Books, Molly, James, Nat, Natalie, Never, Nicole, G, Nicole R, Nine Binary, Page E, Page P, Penny Chilling, Foxglove, Pixel Stars, Pierre Atheon, Rachel B, Rat Sarah, Reba, Rebecca, Ren, Robin, Rosie, Rowan, Other Rowan, Sicoria, Sadie, Samantha, Sarah C, Sarah H, Sarah the Bear, Shamed, Shanae, Shannon, Shana, Sheena K, Sean. I'm not gonna lie to you, all those SH names, I always think I'm gonna stumble there and I don't and I'm really proud of myself. Okay, sorry, moving on. Sophie, Stephanie, Talia, Three Old Dogs, Tina, Toast, Trash Can Teddy, Seb, Valentine, and Writer A. Thank you all so much for being a friend.